Welcome back to Data Innovation Summit 2018. Glad to have all the viewers back here with me and we have some super interesting new panelists with us. We have, on a first name basis, Nick, Timo, and David from Alterix, SAP, and FICO. Is it FICO or should I say FICO? It's FICO. FICO. All right, there we go. So, this panel is about from BI to prescriptive analytics. What is next? Please introduce yourselves and say a little bit what you do with regards to BI and prescriptive analytics. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Timo Elliott, and I'm an innovation evangelist for SAP. SAP is the world leader in business applications, and my background is in analytics. For the last 30 years, I've been talking to business users about the power of data. Cool. Fantastic. So I'm Nick Jewell. I'm a director of product strategy at Alteryx. So we're a leader in the self-service data science space. And really, we take users on that journey from line of business analysts all the way through to citizen data scientists. All right. So I'm David Wright from FICO. I'm responsible for our general optimization business in the media. We have world-class optimization technology at FICO. And so my experience has primarily been there. And I've seen it be either successful or I've seen it not be successful. But uh, certainly seen optimization uh, being very successful and, uh, and growing in, in stature now. But uh, I'm certainly seeing that at this event too. Outstanding. Well, a lot of the de delegates have sent in questions, and many of them have in common that they're wondering what's coming up next. I think it's very excited to be, I mean, easy to be excited about what's coming up next. So uh, why don't you give us a little primer on what you think is going to be relevant in 2018 and what's, you know, what, what is everybody talking about now? Well, the big change for anybody who's followed the analytics market at all, uh, analytics has traditionally been about collecting and storing data and then using it to make better business decisions. That's still incredibly important, but now data is much more than that. It's now at the heart of new digital transformation. So we use business models built more directly on data than ever before to either improve the customer experience or quite literally to sell data directly to new customers in new ways. This is putting new requirements on the type of people that have to be working with the technologies that you all represent. People that need to be more technical, more business savvy. Two of the words that have come up uh, several times today have been speed and collaboration. How do you see those two words being central to the new type of person that is working with these tools? I think that's a really good point. I think when you talk about digital transformation, as Timo just did, we're really talking about cross-collaboration between different functional groups within an organization. I think it was MIT Sloan did a survey, and there was something like 70% of the organizations that have successfully achieved digital transformation do it with cross-functional teams. So they need to collaborate. There needs to be an open, transparent process, but we need to engage the masses. So we're not just talking about data scientists, we're talking about analysts, bringing in information consumers, knowledge workers, and making them part of that process. I think one of the things that's happened is, I want to come at it from the other perspective, to, um, which is uh, to start with the business problems first. Because uh, rather than just looking at data for data's sake, um, and saying, well, what value is there in that data? Um, at FICO, we try to get the client to think about the business challenges they've got, uh, and then looking at the data to see can that data be used to help address some of the business challenges they've got? And so for them, digital transformation in many cases, uh, many companies are still on the journey. Um, I think manufacturing is, is struggling. S struggling because there's a shortage of data scientists. There's a shortage of experts. Uh, I, so I've spoken to a couple of the very large manufacturers in this part of the world. And there's, it's, as long as we can't get data scientists. They're so desperately short of them. So I think you need um, not just data scientists, but I think you also need business analysts, you need people who understand how to translate the, the real problems they're having in terms that data scientists, business analysts, uh, and those working with data in IT will understand. Mm -hmm. And it's the collaboration between those different groups that I think helps uh, to bring some value. Um, and that's what we're seeing. It's a long, slow process. It has a long way to go. I think this event is great in, in raising awareness. Mm -hmm. I think we're still very much in raising the awareness um, stakes for, for, for many companies. So you mentioned that it's hard to get a hold of data scientists and that these data scientists need to collaborate with the business in a certain way. And something we touched on in an earlier panel is the challenge that businesses face in even formulating a data science question. 
I mean, if they're not experts at the domain of, well, we don't even have to explain it in complex terms. If you don't know what's possible, you can't conceive of a solution making use of a certain technology. So how do you guys see um, businesses coping with, uh, with the need to formulate it in terms of data science, uh, but that technology is changing so rapidly? It brings it back to the point you said about speed uh, and agility. What's really, it's really the fundamentally the biggest change is we've always known how to use data effectively to run the business better. But it was typically a very slow process, taking many months. We don't have time that in, uh, to do that in the modern world. But also people, as you said, don't know what they don't know, don't know what they want. So the big change has been this ability to iterate in more agile cycles, taking just a few hours or a few weeks. How about this? How about this? Did you mean this? Uh, we now have the technologies that allow you to do that much more effectively in the past, notably with the cloud. Um, and so that's having a much uh, very powerful change in how business people appreciate the uh, abilities of data. So the it's not just that people used to be slow, it's that these new technologies like the cloud are enabling people to be faster than they could before. Well, can, I, can I say that these, net these technologies are not new? Optimization technology is not new. Neither is machine learning or AI. I mean, FICO has just celebrated our 25th year of machine learning expertise. So they're not new, but I think what we're seeing is, um, is tooling and develop around some of these technologies that's allowing it now to be consumed by companies. Right. Yeah, they're consumed by data science. So, I mean, algorithms are not yeah. new. Some are new, but most of them are not new. But access to huge amounts of data that you can spin up in the cloud very quickly uh, and the power to crunch through all of that data with those algorithms, that's all very, very new. And that's, there's been a huge tipping point just in the last year where it's gone from theoretical to absolutely real and and uh, accelerating. But I think the exciting point though is that democratization. So David, you talked about almost about literacy within the organization. This is now enabling users to be able to grasp the terms and actually the applications in a language they understand. So maybe moving away from nouns where we're saying we want to do a support vector machine or a neural network to, I want to predict a value. I want to find a category. I want to find something that's similar to something else. Right. Those are terms that regular business users understand and they can formulate their problem in that language. And now data scientists are almost getting in the way of progress in some cases. On the one hand, they're expensive, they're hard to find, they need to be very skilled, so there just aren't enough of them. At the same time, though, there is an attitude where it's like, well, I'm going to take the data and show you the perfect model. Whereas increasingly, we do need to democratize it, and it's being built into business applications, for example, where the scope is very well known, you know the decision you need to take, you've got lots of high-quality data, so you don't need all of those data scientist skills for each new project. You can do it and just provide it. Yeah. So I think one of the things that probably as, as, as vendors we all need to learn is, is how to properly engage with some of these clients mm -hmm. because uh, I've done a lot of work with manufacturers and do you know what? They're just not interested in turning down their operations to talk to you about working with their data. They're like throwing huge amounts of data away, being the sensor technologies improved dramatically. Uh, many sensors now are doing analytics on board, for right. example. Um, so getting data and getting it put in, I'm going to use that expression I don't like, but data lake. Yeah. Let's just say they're collecting data and storing it somewhere. Um, that, I think, is the least of the problems. I think the challenge then is, well, what do we use? Um, do we know what we're looking for? What, there are things that are just, we just don't know what some of the problems are. Right. We can see the problems out in the, with our products in the field, but are they due to problems in the way we make products? Are they to do with uh, challenges we're having um, with processes about the way we make our products or, or something else. So we have to learn to be flexible and have, have tooling that allows you to look in at those sorts of challenges in an unsupervised way so that you can find things that we just don't even know. If you know you're looking for something and you're looking for it for a supervised fashion, then I think all of our companies have got the right sort of data science experts that can do that. But I think companies, uh, are, certainly manufacturers, are going strongly down the di digital twin route. Right. That's exactly why they go in that route. So they can be safe, they can replicate an environment mm. and use that as a, as a, to try and showcase any, any anomalies and show where they might be able to improve their operations. So we're seeing the digital twin route is, is, is quite interesting in manufacturers. It's a low risk way. I think that's what we have to look for. We're gonna bring this technology on faster, 
you mentioned speed. Custom companies do want solutions quicker, and they want to be able to use the solutions as business users. They don't want to be experts. They don't want a, a tool that means they've got to be a data science expert or an optimization expert. It's got to be something very usable for them that gives some business value. Mm -hmm. But they don't necessarily want to change at no. all. Sorry, you were saying. No, no, no. I, I agree. Yep. <laughs> I, I just think fundamentally, all of our companies are here today to try and sell to people the idea that companies want to run more experiments. They want to do it at that data science level. They want to look at telemetry from Internet of Things and sensor devices. But they also need to run business experiments that can be run in that agile way, Timo, that you mentioned. So that now means getting closer to a business problem, continually delivering and being able to talk to a product owner of the, of the objective and refine as they understand over time. I think it was Jeff Bezos that said, you know, an experiment that you know is going to succeed isn't an experiment at all. There is going to be an element of failure, and we need to do this in a safe, productive environment. That's actually one of the big changes for vendors like ourselves, is that um, the SAP is uh, known to be a valuable product, with uh, typically uh, relatively expensive. But to do this kind of experiment, people say, well, no, we're not going to pay for a big upgrade before we see any results. We want to buy in small experimental packages. So that's what we've been doing, is providing like focused smaller solutions where people can experiment with a bundle of products so they can adapt over time. So it really is about digital transformation for us as well, adapting how we're selling these technologies so people consume them in uh, easier ways. Mm -hmm. I think um, if you go back five years or more, um, if you were deploying an optimization application, you, you would model the application. I don't think too much has changed in terms of the modeling and the speed of the modeling. What's changed is uh, are, are the the tooling that allows users to use the application. Right. That's what's changed. Right. Um, uh, and I think now we're used to seeing um, uh, proof of concept that in in a matter of a few weeks, right. where you're demonstrating value very quickly, yeah. rather than in months or uh, even years. You know, we often have to wait for a first iteration after six months, and if that worked. You did another iteration another six months later. I think those I think we're seeing the end of those days. Right. And you've seen you were seeing with R in the predictive analytics world, we're seeing with pi, new, new technologies like Python. So these these new techniques are all moving um, our, our user interface development forward very rapidly and, mm -hmm. and, and tools that are able to work with these in some cases open source technology, a range of technologies, your tools need to be open. Uh, they're the ones that I think are gonna succeed. At the same time, companies are really struggling to change the way they work in order to take full advantage Absolutely. of that. Absolutely. Often there's a small department whose job it is to go and do some innovation, but they rapidly run into the rest of the big corporate machine that is just not designed around that kind of... Most companies are not designed around agile, flexible, iterative innovation. <laughs> so it's, it's about much more than the technology. They're risk averse, aren't they? Companies are risk averse. If they see risk, they, they smell risk, they step away from it. Well, I well, think which, uh, is, which is necessarily a down uh, bad thing, but we're we're really talking about making the risks bite sized. Yeah. If you take enough small bite sized risks, you're actively optimizing your opportunity of finding the big next. That's fair. Well, I heard a nice anecdote about why there is a need for conservative and for progressive people, and that is that you have the progressives to start up the new companies and try risky ideas, mm -hmm. and then when you want it to run on rails you bring in the people that you know have best practice and then you they run it conservatively but some of these technologies that are changing uh and are disruptive right now are non-mainstream and the business advantage you're getting from using something non-mainstream is is palpable to say the least because, well nobody's using it so well, I'll, I'll call that out so so what do we mean by non-mainstream I, I honestly believe that open source has won a gigantic part of this battle so R, Python they're now established utilities to build data science applications on top of true it's it's certain now we understand what it is and we understand what it does it's now whether it can be deployed into a culture that needs to mature well, the, the blockchain for example I would argue okay. the blockchain is not mainstream Absolutely yet not. No. so you're not in business um, but then it's not necessarily shown massive massive advantages for traditional companies yet either. No, I, I think it's because it's a, such a hype thing that people aren't using it for what it was designed for to begin with. They're using it like a database. Yeah. Just, but, th but there'll be a tipping point really, really soon. So for example, in the banking world, Ripple being that blockchain yeah. to, to help replace bits of the SWIFT network for payments right, and get right. closer to real time. When that tips, other organizations, other verticals will really start to see that benefit. Uh, we have some very real solutions in the pipeline, uh, notably uh, track and trace for pharmaceuticals. 
you want immutable chain of knowing exactly where your drugs are at any moment? So I think with many companies, uh, maybe the ones that have used VI in the past, uh, what road do we take them on? I think the road we take them on, we help them to understand what that wider analytics uh, picture looks like. You know, that road right from um, descriptive, what is, through predictive, uh, the use of optimization, you know, and at each stage you can show how you can benefit with a certain level of automation. But what we, what we can show is that the more of the analytics pie they use, the more complete your decisions get. Yep. And I think that's really important. Uh, uh, and I, I think customers are, many customers have, have maybe done, I think BI is pretty well sold now. It's 80% of businesses use BI. Whereas if, once you get down to predictive, it's like it's less than 50%. Then when you get to optimization, it's more like less than 25%. So you can still see there's a, there's a long way to go in terms of getting this, these technologies accessible and being used by businesses. But I think we have a responsibility in, in the business to show customers the consequences of not going down that road. And that is the competitive advantage they're going to lose because there are, in all markets, there are leaders, there are those that follow. What's a good way to quantify that advantage? Because that seems to be something that, um, you know, oil and gas and others that, that have a, a, a tangible uh, you know, foundation, they don't, they don't have that fire in their butts right now from knowing that, well, either that there's a lost revenue stream or that there's perhaps some disruptive startup that could change, change the shape of things. So I, so I see this coming down to a maturity in, say, the chief data officer within an organization. And it's some research is sort of emerging in this space, but we might call it infonomics. So the idea of treating information as an asset. So you can use analytics in defense or in offense mode. So defense is risk mitigation, optimization of costs, that kind of thing. Yeah. Or you use it in offense mode, where we're trying to monetize our data, maybe create data products, or actually embed the analytic models we produce to the public, make them customer facing, make them more visible. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's really gonna emerge over the next couple of years. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I completely agree. The, the first step to take with these new technologies is a big step back at one level, and to, think again about the big picture because what happened is that we used to having processes in businesses that generate data and we use that data to generate the processes. But now we've almost flipped it the other way around in that the data is being used to create new processes. Right. Think about the customer experience. It used to be sort of fairly linear. I'd see an ad, I'd go to a store, I'd buy the product and lots of people would be doing the same thing. Now, everybody expects a very unique customer experience, mm. but guess what? That's powered by data. So each customer is getting a very unique set of offers and channels based on the context, their demographics, so that each customer is essentially following their own individualized, customized process powered by analytics. Mm. And it's, so it's a big change because that's part of what customers, uh, companies are selling. It's part of the customer experience. So the business people are more interested in data than they've ever been in the past. Because yeah. it's not just about, I've got some reports on my profitability by product. This is something that I need to iterate in near real time because... I, I can, can affect a decision. I can actually yeah. change a customer's behavior by using data. Yeah, customer retention, for example, classic example, using algorithms. Now we can... Uh, we have something called a customer pulse. So like a pulse in a, in a hospital, we can see if there's something out of the ordinary with their, their interactions with us over the last 40 days, 100 days. And if there's something that's out of the ordinary, we can predict whether that means it's going to turn into customer churn or not. So that's an area I'm fascinated in. So the idea that as we get closer to real time, as we get closer to streaming, so that could be sensors or that could be individuals on that personalized journey, anomaly detection, yeah. understanding when something's about to go wrong or has just gone wrong. And with digital transformation, we're starting to see, I think, these prescriptive analytics getting embedded directly in the process. So for example, machinery can now phone in and book itself a service purely based on the fact it's likely to fail in the next X number of hours. Right. We're currently working on an application called adaptive scheduling, mm. where actually it's involving both the use of prescriptive optimization and some uh, predictive analytics to have a constant feedback loop to constantly improve the processes automatically. Yeah. So as you as you submit your factory to new production constraints or, or new demands, the models will produce the, the data and re and, uh, uh, and that will re-optimize the operation continuously. And that, so 
that is something that I think is going to be the future for, for the for process industries. Uh, we're seeing similar sorts of uh, challenges in additive manufacturing as well. Mm. Uh, and something else I wanted to add, we're, we're thinking about the nuts and bolts of how companies use the technology. Maybe also we need to think about what's driving that. So the sort of things that we're seeing, for example, in, 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 in retail, just as an example, and in telco, where you're seeing now this desire to use personalization services using digital products. Right. That's going to change. Just think about that in retail, for example, about the potential there for uh, using analytics to personalize services for individual clients. Mm. Um, so now we're thinking about more the revenue end, right. which is what customers are interested in. So again, they're, they're saying, okay, so digital transformation can help us be competitive and reduce our costs in exactly the way that you say in a negative, in a, not negative, um, defensive way. Defensive, almost a passive way. Uh, but what, where can it really help us now improve what we do for our customers? So for example, we're talking to one client at the moment that has, they're a white goods manufacturer and they've got reliability problems with things like washing machines and uh, tumble dryers in the field that they think are related to something they're doing in production. So they they want to look at the data to try and find is there is there a problem there? It's like an unknown we're looking for. Right. But again it's related to this it's costing them money to keep going back servicing the same machines. Is that a component? Is it where well, we're manufacturing a, a piece of fabrication? What is it? And so it, being driven by the revenue side, being driven by the business uh, in that way, I think is going to be one of the, one of the big drivers that sometimes we ignore. We think Oh, there's data, there's push, there's push from the data side because we've got all this data, but there's a lot of pull from, uh, from customers as well mm. that are going to drag this kicking and screaming. This digital transformation process, they're going to help to accelerate it so that we're sitting here in five years thinking, you know, what's the next revolution going to be? Right. And I mean, what are the technology enablers for that process? We're talking cloud. We mentioned that earlier on. So we're talking about effectively unlimited compute, easy storage. All of us as analytic vendors need to be aware of that and make sure that that's really part of that solution as well. So we can not only store the telemetry, but we can run the analytics in exactly that same environment. And I think the big takeaway for prescriptive analytics is that, as you said, every product, service, and internal process, we now have the possibility of it being automatically better over time and as more people use it. Right. Right? We're used to looking at a process, gathering data, analyzing it, and a human being coming along and seeing how, where they could tweak it. With machine learning, a lot more of that can happen at, automatically mm. uh, in almost every aspect of business, from finance to HR to analytics itself. Right. Well, I'm glad we're circling back to prescriptive analytics because uh, I'll contend your point that this is uh, not something new. Uh, there are a couple of algorithms that have been you know, developing and being refined in the past 10 years that are able to do things that were fairly unimaginable only 10 years ago. And if you look at how robotics is handled today, a lot of it is still programmed with signals and systems algorithms manually. It rather, uh, Yeah, so for example, the way a joint moves in an arm, there are some singularities where no matter what currency you apply, it won't unlock itself. Mm. And you need to remove those manually. And it's all signals and systems work. Yes. That can be handled by deep learning much, much better. It can be optimized. Sure. And so Absolutely. what kind of an advantage uh, wouldn't a company have if they used this entirely new? T so this enables a new kind of business. It's not just a refinement yeah. of what existed before. What's made a big difference is processing power. So processing power has made a huge difference to the amount of the techniques, the linear programming techniques, yes, they've improved, but the technology, the core technology has been around a long time. So neural networks go back to 1950s, yeah, right? They, they, you, you couldn't train but, a neural the, network that was the, deeper than five layers. It, well, exactly. Process, so, but it wasn't the algorithm. No, it was. So, so, well, so it, you didn't have the, the back, you know, rectifier the back, activations. The back you didn't have dropouts. Yeah, you didn't the, have all these extra. The but these are 10 years old. And the tools around the algorithms right. it's more and help to move things faster. It's the data. You need an enormous volume of data to train a deep learning system. And that's also what's been able with that telemetry. Well, the MNIST data set was what, what propelled image recognition in, in deep learning. And that was a bunch of students that they asked to write a bunch of numbers down. So yeah. case but in point. Modeling is important too. I mean, for example, um, if, you, if you build a, a, an optimization model and it's not right, it, even as a very simple error, it mm. will run very, very slowly. Yeah. And, and often 
uh, just changing something fairly simple and fundamental, um, or, or tuning uh, or tuning the, um, the 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 way the application runs in a better way will, will give you big a big uplift in performance. Mm. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that sort of road testing, if you like, of applications. Most uh, most companies now they're looking seriously at, at optimization. They want to evaluate. Evaluate first, evaluate first. It's still very much starting at the operations research level. Now, they're guys that want to come in and test. Our attitude is fine if you want to come in and test. Let us know. Um, we're here to help. And um, I, I, every, I think every time we, we go through an evaluation process, we come out of it pretty well. So I think the technology is... Let, let me follow up on this. We, we're talking about um, accessibility to data scientists. Yeah. And the delegates are wondering, let's see here, we had a nice one. What is the relationship between coders and clickers? <laughs> So, are people? Uh, do do we need people to be programmers in order yes. to take advantage of these technologies? Both. Well, yes, I, I think both. both both is the right answer. Speaking from Alteryx perspective, where you know we are a code-free and a code-friendly solution, so working with analysts and data scientists, mm. they work nicely together in the right environment. So, in terms of have we made life easier for the clickers? Absolutely. There is more power at their fingertips than ever before. Drag and drop, connect it up, get the results but the key is interpretability and explainability. There's no sense using a black box if you don't understand the number that's coming out of it. In most regulated environments, you can't put that thing into production. Mm. From a code-friendly point of view, the coders, we want to bridge that gap. So I see data science organizations sitting in ivory towers. They struggle to get their work operational and used by the rest of the business. Why is that? What's the biggest hurdle? So number one, they don't have the right support structure. They don't have the right chain in of the command. organization. Sponsorship, exactly, at that level. But number two, they don't communicate very well outside the ivory tower. Mm -hmm. So they build things. They get very, very excited about their results. But the analysts on the ground don't get to use their contents. So by taking coding, putting it inside a code-free environment, we start to get feedback, and we start to get iteration, and everything improves. The executive sponsorship is something people have mentioned several times today. Mm -hmm. What kind of executive sponsorship? Do you need to, put, okay, now we need to have a CDO, we need to have a, a center of excellence. Like, what kind of executive sponsorship is necessary to get these off the ground? Somebody that cares about data. Honestly, it's as simple as that. If you have a chief executive that will, for example, only look at the reports and data generated by the internal analytic systems mm -hmm. and will refuse to look at the spreadsheets that have been hacked together by people with all of the exceptions. That alone is worth its weight in gold in getting the rest of the organization to align in actually making that analytic system high data quality, easy to use, and so on. I think as well there's a, there's a sort of view that I think customers have is that I think most, ex most executives, sea level people in businesses, they're so busy running their businesses mm. successfully. And I don't think that they necessarily want to know about data science or I think they want to know and understand that used productively it can help bring vis business value uh, to the organization. But I think, I think they I don't think they've changed. I think they need to know what value it's going to bring. Well, I can imagine their gut feeling has served them well in the past. Yeah. So what, what are convincing arguments? And you're all representing technology companies. What kind of things can you add to somebody, uh, the head of a conglomerate that feels that uh, uh, their, their e-commerce, uh, or no, their, their brick and mortar stores are go doing just fine the way they are. Now, we, we, we mentioned Toys R Us was shutting down uh, at the, with the earlier panelists. Uh, I don't think they were nervous a couple of years ago, but perhaps they should have been. I, what, be, is, what are convincing arguments? I'll be honest, I don't meet many of those people anymore. Mm. There used to be more of them. Now it's typically the head of a small or medium-sized family-owned company. That's okay. pretty much the only time you find somebody who doesn't care about data now. There's been an entire generation. Today's uh, CIO CEOs are the first generation of CIO CEOs that grew up with PCs in the home. They take computing for granted. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to say that. I'm going to say the same with chief data officers as well. So generation one of that CDO, probably the last five years, we're really talking about just cleaning up the mess. So it might be master data management. It's getting your reference data in order. It's setting the groundwork to do better things. The second generation is starting to come through. And this is now where we're seeing advanced analytics and data-driven experiments leading the agenda. So execs aren't as blind as they were a few years ago, and they're not as trusting as they were a few years ago. They're going to run an experiment, and they're going to get multiple points of view. There's much greater maturity and awareness of data. So to answer your question, the relationship between the coders and the clickers, clickers uh, is much better than it's ever been, mm -hmm. because there has been an absolutely determined effort at bringing them together around these new themes. And both sides get it. I think we need to get to word as well. I mean, a question I was asked recently was, well, look, um, our business is, 
has moved 50% to the in, to the internet in the last three years. Mm. And the way it, that's completely disrupted my supply chain. I, I've got, I've got distribution center that serve my, um, uh, my online business and distribution center that serve my stores business. And they're completely different. They're driven by a different dynamic. How can I put them together? Right. To give to to give me benefit because at the moment they both seem far too costly. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of conversation you're going to have with someone running a business, and those are the sort of problems they're going to present you with. Now, it is possible to solve that using the technologies that our organisations have, but I think you have to have a conversation at that level, and and it's it's a slightly provocative conversation, right? Because you know companies that get to grips with it first, they're going to get competitive advantage. I'm going to talk about Amazon, not pushing Amazon. But Amazon are one of the biggest consumers of um, uh, analytics. They use optimization widely as well. And they are now being seen. I think they're the second largest company now, I yep. think, in America, the uh, corporate company in America. But they are not frightened to try and embrace new technologies in their organization. They've got a supply chain that a lot of companies would, um, would be very keen to get their hands on. They patent lots of things. They're even using analytics to anticipate when we might buy something and stocking for it yeah. and they and they've painted those sorts of applications so we should be looking that's how successful businesses are being run and lots of people are looking at that as a potential model but then you think about the supply chain and then suddenly take that net back one stage further then to your manufacturing so if your supply chain changes and all the signals and the way that supply chain is run chain or the way sorry the way that the signals about the way that supply chain runs change, mm. then the manufacturers have also got to get in step as well. Otherwise, can't help but wonder if if, if Walmart and the others, world. if Walmart and the others saw Amazon as a threat in 2005 and thought that they should start applying these yeah. principles as well. Yeah, nobody even saw AWS as being a threat when it came out. It was laughed out of the room several times back in the last decade, you know. And look at it now; it's going to be moving Amazon towards being a trillion dollar business. Speaking of the cloud. Uh, Many cloud providers, meaning Amazon and Microsoft, provide really nice end-to-end -end solutions. Know. That was a jab there. <laughs> really provide uh, really nice end-to-end -end solutions that they market as um, we handle everything from the data ingestion to you know, your Excel and all the Hadoop and everything in between. What do you say to customers uh, who, who uh, talk about soft, or software as a service in the cloud, switch on, switch off, and that kind of thing? Where, where do you, mm. other technologies fit into that? I'll take it first then. So I, th I think Amazon and, and Microsoft offer amazing utilities. I question whether or not they're a completely integrated platform mm. because a lot of them don't necessarily <coughs> talk nicely together. So that interconnectivity is what really defines a platform for me. Mm. And also the openness to bring partners into that ecosystem to work with the platform to enrich it is what makes the difference. So I think they've got some great capabilities and we love building off many of their utilities. But is it that integrated platform that's gonna speak to a line of business analyst? I would disagree with today's stack. Mm. I think it's a lot. For companies to swallow the end-to-end -end story and i think you need to start somewhere um i'm biased aren't i because i'm focused on optimization but actually it's a good starting point point. and one of the things that we're seeing as you start with the, with optimization uh, particularly say in, um, in a production environment or in a logistics operation is that you can then very easily take the next step which is to say well maybe five years ago you used demand data your, your old demand data to optimize the way you you run your plant or your way you, you you run your or your your machine processes actually what we can now there's a lot more data available now so maybe we can take some enriched data oh we'll tell you what let's build some predictive models and actually do some predictive analysis before we actually optimize so i'm going to use a classic one in a plant uh, and there's a, there are solutions out there doing this today um which are predictive maintenance Right. So you've got thousands of machines in a plant and you want to understand when those machines possibly could fail. Now there are solutions out there at the moment where are being offered where the companies will offer the sensor technology, they'll right. collect the data, they'll do some very, very raw analytics on it and it, that will come a, a, a metric that says a traffic light system, 
I've seen traffic light systems, red, green, or yellow. Yes, mm. that machine's working okay. If it's green, if it's hot, if it's yellow, then maintain it. Someone else saying maintain your machine in six weeks or whatever, whatever it is. So, but we're not seeing a huge amount of granularity um, right. and, and detail in what's provided. Uh, and we're also not seeing the next stage, which is it's not just enough to know when your machine's going to fail. You've got thousands of machines in a modern plant. Right. So you need a, an optimized plan as to when you're going to yeah. maintain them. Yeah. Okay. So if you start with this idea that we can use optimization for better planning and you can look at multiple time frames for planning, then augment it with um, predictive models, augment it with some of this data, and you can suddenly start to widen the, the spheres of influence. Then the next question then is, okay, well, maybe... Actually, now, before we actually predict what might happen here, how about if we actually be more selective about, uh, about the data we're actually using in our predictive models? So let's apply, let's fire s uh, some banks of business rules to take this massive data and be more selective, stream it, let's be more selective about the data we think we're going to use. So each time it's about enriching, at each stage you're enriching the output so by the time you get to optimization, using a very, very rich data set, mm -hmm. and your optimization is then so much better. And so the whole thing gives you better support, better decision, better decision support throughout the process. It also completes the picture. Right. I think that's just my opinion of a good way to start. I'm not saying it's the only way to start. You could start the other end. You could start by enhancing your BI. It doesn't matter. But that's well, one approach that we I found works. We should focus on that. Um, <clears throat> again, the title of this panel is From BI to Prescriptive Analytics. And you could say that there is a step in between BI, or rather prescriptive analytics could be divided into two steps. One is uh, what has happened, and two is what should I do about it. And then you can automate that as well, if you're, if you're fairly confident that the, the what should I do about it is, is any good. And um, you can do prescriptive analytics without having done BI at all. That's yeah. the other aspect. Well, that, that my question was going to be, uh, I think a lot of companies are under the impression that you have to lift the whole company at once, like Correct. Tide. Yeah. You, you feel that you have to lift the entire company at once, or can you do different? So here, you're free, feel free to uh, debate. I, I say you can start wherever you want. Yeah. It, 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 you know, you, across the spectrum, you can start wherever you want. And the key thing is that if you've got, if you've got tools that can embrace maybe BI, um, predictive and optimization, similar tools that business users can use as well, that's a help. Mm. So what you want to avoid is having completely different tools and algorithms at every single stage of the, fact, uh, of the process so that companies feel like it's taking too much on. Mm. And um, I think we've successfully sold to, to many optimization technology, many companies, but we now find that some of those companies are now coming back and they're saying, okay, we've got that, what else can you do? And I take a step back. I'd actually go back even before BI and say, do you even understand what your analysts and data scientists are accessing? So one of, one of the concerns that my customers really have is around gray data. So if I work in a financial services company, um, I'm looking at a dashboard as an executive, what's sourcing this data? Is it coming from one of my enterprise data warehouses from the lake, from somewhere else? Or is it somebody's spreadsheet that they've manipulated and it's somehow flowed into the enterprise context? So curating, cataloging, bringing in, I guess, tribal knowledge from across the organization and then telling people what can be trusted and its lineage. Mm. That's the number one starting point for me. So get that right across the board, automated as much as possible, sound foundation for BI, predictive. So that foundation needs to be in place before the other ones. I'm, I'm, I'm saying you can definitely have BI and you can have prescriptive without it. I'm just saying you have a stronger foundation if you understand the assets you're working so with. I'd say, so BI is fundamentally about people looking at data and making big strategic decisions. And because it's about people, the biggest barrier barrier is not the technology, it's culture, and it has been for a long time. Prescriptive analytics can truly be much more lower level and automated and still provide massive value. For example, we did a project with a large chemicals company um, They uh, for an invoice matching. Right. So they send out an invoice, they get a payment back, they get that information from the bank. 70% mm. uh, of the time, it doesn't match. The reference numbers are different. There's two payments for one invoice, two invoices for one payment. And so it has to go to a big room where there's lots of people shuffling papers around trying to figure out which invoice goes where. Um, we, so it was we worked with one company. They got it up to 70% with a whole bunch of uh, hard-coded rules mm -hmm. that needed maintaining. But with machine learning applied to the same uh, 
opportunity. We got it to 94% within two weeks. And this is an organization that has hundreds of thousands of invoices. So that's a massive savings in time, money, and effort. But nothing to do with BI, really, not how we think of it. Right. But absolutely prescriptive analytics, using machine learning on a complex data set to make optimal But uh, please expand and, sorry, on one thing. And so, and so but the other is, you got 94%, but it's still improving mm. because every time there's an exception, it gets kicked out to a person that says, this is the right answer. Right. The algorithm learns from it. So again, it's one of those self-optimizing processes that's getting better automatically over time. Well, so I'd like to, to expand on that 94% thing. I think a lot of people are under the impression that a solution or a machine learning algorithm or some prescription needs to be perfect in order for it to be valuable. Uh -huh. I think this is no. probably one of the big challenges, actually, in terms of communicating what you've built as a data scientist. So there is going to be a confidence level. And I don't think us as an industry, us as vendors, do enough yet to communicate the uncertainty in our models. So there's a level of empathy, I think, within the outputs that we produce, where we need to tell people, this is not a dead cert. There is uncertainty here, and you need to understand the risks you take if you take up the recommendation. Or the so it's a war before you run approach, yeah. I think, that, the, that we need to adopt. The other thing we need to recognize is that the pace of business change for organizations is, is like it's never been before. It's continuing to change. So you might build a model that's fit for purpose now mm. in six months. That, that business changes fundamentally. It's no longer fit for purpose. Right. So again, there needs to be flexibility in, in being able to modify and change your applications. And so it's getting harder and harder for what I call package vendor solutions yeah. to survive. Uh, oh, and I'd say almost the opposite, depending on how you define package solutions. So to, to get the most value out of AI, you want large quantities of high quality data. Yep. So you typically got that as part of a business application, for example. You want a, a nice, tightly defined scope of decision, a repetitive, complex decision that you're making yep. hundreds of thousands of times a day. Supply chain optimization, what product do I offer to a customer that's just about to purchase something? Those kinds of decisions. And then you want to ideally be able to take action directly as part of the business process. So we're actually building machine learning into everything we do. That, that invoice matching, that's just one example of one small branch of finance. There are thousands of those that we can optimize. Gartner believes that, uh, let's see, half a billion users will save two hours a day, a day this year thanks to AI-powered tools. Right. This is what they're talking about. That's, that's actually, that adds up to half a million years of increased productivity this year alone. Mm -hmm. So, team, that's how, a, so how, but just that is a massive I opportunity. With that. The only thing I was saying was hard coding is is no 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 yeah, no, yeah. so they, absolutely it needs to be the flexibility. De DevOps is the de is the yes. discipline that's now spreading absolutely. into our world. That continuous absolutely. integration, that right, and the, and machine learning algorithms continuous absolutely and are hard coded. Cycle. They're they're constantly learning DevOps and improving into BI and prescriptive analytics because I think when people hear DevOps. Uh, they think uh, IT systems. Well, I've that, heard yeah. the term ML ops. Or science ops, whatever yeah, yeah. you want to call it, right? But the I idea science ops. <laughs> right, yeah. right. The, the idea is it's those same disciplines we talked about when we mentioned what is <clears throat> agile when it comes to an analyst. Right. right. So it's just all about iteration, it's about experimentation, mm -hmm. and it's about continuous test driven development to check whether you're right, get that feedback faster in the cycle. Timo, I had a question based on what you were just saying around you're predicting so many things at such a volume and such a velocity. Yeah. How do you provide the user with a confidence on, on what you predict? Or do you, do you analyze it afterwards in a BI environment? So every, your, every process where you're applying machine learning, you're essentially outsourcing decision making to, to the machines. Yeah. So it's absolutely essential to have safeguards, yeah. governance, checks. Uh, so the, the, most of the time we're using the, the qualified people to train and guide the process, the machine, the uh, invoice matching. Sure. So it starts by saying, we think this is the answer with this amount of confidence. Right. Are we right? And the more often we, we, it says it's right, we say, well, you know what? Would you just like us to do this automatically next time? But it's finance, it's money, it still has to go to audit, you still have to be able to show what's happening. So crucially, domain expertise, absolutely vital. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Could I, could I just bring in another fact that's important as well? We haven't, I think we touched on it, but we've not really developed it, and that is change management, which uh, I think um, we've probably all seen stuff fail because people didn't want to embrace it. It's, so I want it's to go, the biggest barrier. So still. I want to go back to the, col the collaboration thing again. Mm -hmm. uh, change management is absolutely vital, particularly when you're changing processes. It might well be better for the business, but if they all go on strike for six months because they're not going to have that process anywhere near their plant, right? And uh, that happens a lot. Is that uh, many digital transformation is is worrying 
employees. They're thinking, am I, am I going to have a job tomorrow? Mm. Is, is automation going to spell the end of, of my career that I, that I envisage? So, so change management to show that actually um, bringing these new technologies will actually allow people to do different jobs, more productive jobs, better jobs, uh, I think is important. Well, it's a mixture of both, right? We have to be honest. Yeah. There's going to be some there's going to be some, some roles. There's that, going to be some attrition, definitely. definitely. But uh, it's mostly about displacing work rather than replacing work. Exactly. Yeah. I, I like to think of it as augmented intelligence, right? So we're, we're going to allow people to be so much more productive yeah. by having systems of intelligence supporting that job. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Because again, to go back to manufacturing, what's the big problem in the UK? It's not just the UK, other countries, low productivity. And low productivity in, man, in many cases is held back by the failure to embrace change rather than technology oh, I'm, I'm nodding furiously purely because of the reason it's not just manufacturing I'm going to take an Excel analyst somebody that's working yep. 28 hours a week inside a spreadsheet new data comes in I'm going to spend nine of those ah. hours rebuilding that spreadsheet Spreadsheets. talk about low productivity the old enemy spreadsheets <laughs> the McKinsey study said exactly the same thing that data processing data collection is by far the mo most automatable area using these new techniques. I, I think that's what, degree, worth mentioning to the customers when they're asking why is it so expensive to hire a data scientist to fix this stuff. That's because it's so valuable to get rid of those five hours per person per week <laughs> doing all that work. That's so valuable. Last question. We have a couple of minutes left. Uh, this is from BI to prescriptive analytics. Uh, interpretability of the output is something we touched on uh, a little bit and uh, I'm of the opinion that some of these uh, new methods in deep learning uh, are able to model problems that are perhaps more complicated than what we understand ourselves. I think driving a helicopter is a good example. We've never been able to manually uh, uh, guide a helicopter with signals and systems, but we've trained models that have copied humans to do it. Mm -hmm. It's because the domain is just so complicated. And a lot of people say that the model is opaque, but perhaps the business reality is opaque. Society is complicated. Your business is complicated. How do we deal with those uh, uh, environments? In banks, for instance, when you're calculating risk, it might not be as simple as saying, well, you're wearing these pants and so your risk is five. I, I wouldn't let algorithms anywhere near that level of complexity. That's just not what they're best at. And there's so many massive opportunities with far simpler, more repeatable processes that we do know that... Let's, let's take the exhaust... Leave, leave that, that to the researchers and the data scientists. It's about, and it's about giving the human being more expertise, more, more knowledge to make a better decision. It's decision support. Ultimately, we, the, the idea is not, yes, we can automate mundane tasks, but in areas like that, risk, you've still got to allow the, the, the human being the ability to be able to decide at the end of the day. And I think any decent um, application will allow many levers to be changed and pulled to make sure that you can shape and understand the problem and present it in the way in which you want to do and, it. And it's right, there's a massive uh, ethical connection. Yeah. Anytime you use these algorithms that yeah. touch human experience, mm. there's huge, uh, huge dangers. I recommend a book, uh, Weapons of Math Destru Destruction. <laughs> yep. Anybody who's in this industry that hasn't read this kind of book or these kinds of articles absolutely should because it's going to be essential in the future. We, yeah. We've seen Watson, I think, with the Chicago Police Department discriminating out of the box based on the data. And we've got to be so, so careful. Right. Thank you very much.